Well, welcome to Holy Trinity and St Saviour's Sermons. Here we seek to live life to the full and I hope this sermon inspires you to do exactly that. Okay. Right, this morning's reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 32 to 51. Sorry, I have to make sure I can read it. <laughs> I forgot my glasses. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle of the Lord is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. This is the word of the Lord. I might have a co-preacher today. Hey buddy. Good morning. It's nice to see you all. 
Uh, it's quite a gruesome story, that one, isn't it? I feel like a 21st century Hollywood director needs to get hold of the story of David and Goliath because it would look epic on a big screen. The first thing to understand is it was a very different time back then. Uh, we haven't got time to go into all the details, but you can look at stories like that and go, God's hero just didn't just kill a guy, but also just rubbed it in by cutting off his head. Uh, But it was a different time, and that's a different discussion, because we're looking at the life of David. And um, as Richard said, last week we looked at how David was called to be king. But there was a different king at that point, and his name was Saul. And between when David was called to be king, hey buddy, and uh, when he actually became king was quite a big period of time because Saul believed he was the rightful king and so he decided, no, I don't want to step aside. So we'll see a lot more about that and we'll hear a lot more about that. But today we're looking at the story of David and Goliath. And so before we start, I want to ask you a question. What are your Goliaths? What are the things in your life that fill you with fear and cause you to freeze and cause you to not be able to do anything or step into the things that God is calling you to do? What, what are your Goliaths? What are the giants in your lives? Just have a think about that for a moment. And as we start to look at the story, um, let's go back a bit from our reading. It's an epic passage, by the way. It's like twice as long as the reading was today. So we had to cut it down, but we felt like we couldn't cut it down anymore. Otherwise, you just get random bits of of the story. And so we cut it down a little bit and we focused on that reading uh, for reasons that will become clear. But we need to look at the story. And you might be able to help. So just wait there a second. Um, I haven't asked them, but... Wayne and Josh, could you come and help me a second? Is that okay? Is that right? Sorry, I've just, I've just thrown this upon you. Um, because whenever you're looking at the story of David and Goliath, you, you need to just, you need to put everything in, in perspective. So let's... Uh, Am I going to fight him? If you want. Oh, yeah. Good, excellent. But, but you may have noticed by the size difference, you might not end up the winner. Okay, and you might end up with no head. Okay, so... Uh, so you're not actually going to fight, it's fine. Uh, so who looks more like a mean Israelite army and who looks more, no, not mean, mean Philistine army, sorry, and who looks more like a terrified Israelite army? There's no good parts, by the way, other than David in this story. Everybody else is pretty useless, uh, so sorry about that. Uh, let's say these guys, you guys are the people of God, okay? You can be the people of God and you guys can be the mean Philistines. Are you, can you be that on that side? Excellent. Already taking up your parts. I can see on your faces. And you guys in the middle can be the valley. Can you do valley? Excellent. Good. You're the valley. Caleb, you can just be, I don't know, like the narrator or something. Okay, so, uh, Josh, you're going to be David. So, wait, you guys are the Israelites. So, uh, Josh, come over here a second. Good. You stand there. Uh, If you're watching at home, sorry if this becomes... uh, uh, out of your view, sorry about that. You're not tall enough, uh, so you are quite tall. Uh, I need another chair. Oh, this one, good. You're not scared of heights, are you, Wayne? Okay, good. So, um, basically what was happening was, there was a dance going on um, in the middle. Can you stand on that chair? Good, excellent, be nice and stable. Uh, th- so, there was... Um, The Israelite army and the Philistine army, lifelong enemies, had approached one another on the battlefield. And what what was happening at the time was uh, the Israelite army took place on one side of the valley uh, and the Philistine army took place on the other side of the valley. And for what reason, we're not sure at this point, because they didn't always do battles like this where they sent out one warrior. One thought is that actually the Philistines knew that they were outmatched if they all had a fight with each other. So they were they were like, let's send out just a giant champion and go one on one and try and win it that way. That's one thought. There's lots of others, but we haven't got time to go into this. But for whatever reason, on this day, the Philistine armies sent out their champion, Goliath. This is the champion. Now, the thing you need to know about Goliath is, this, this, is, this by the way, is not actual size. Uh, so he had a spear... He had a sword, which I haven't got with me. Uh, You'll have to picture a sword. But as you may have noticed in the passage, he had a sword and a spear, 
Did anyone else notice there was something else? And a javelin. Okay, so we had a sword, a spear. By the way, the spear would have been more similar uh, to one of these organ pipes. Perhaps not the one in the middle, uh, but one of these. It would have been kind of maybe two or three inches thick. With all spears, it would have been taller than Goliath. And the, from the measurements we have in the Bible, it's estimated that Goliath was somewhere between nine and 11 feet tall. So you potentially still aren't quite tall enough on the chair. Now, some... Some people say from some of the Greek translations that, that actually Goliath was more like a mere six foot seven. Uh, but I think by the descriptions of what he had on him, he was really big. Whether he was nine and 11 feet tall or six foot seven and just massive, he was really big because it describes his armor as being around 57 kilograms. Just to put that in perspective, the average medieval suit of armor, including helmet, would have weighed between 15 and 25 kilograms. So from the measurements we have in the Bible, Goliath wore a, a suit, some kind of suit of armor that was two or three times the weight of standard, the, of medieval time that we know so well, uh, suits of armor. So he had his spear, he had a sword, and he had some kind of javelin. Oh, careful, careful, it's getting, in, getting in too much. Some kind of javelin on his back. And every day, they sent Goliath out, and he came out, and he looked at the Israelites, and he basically taunted them. And he said, send me your best soldier, and we will fight. And basically what happened was the Israelites, you can play this part now, just looked terrified. Can you be terrified for me? Good, terrified. Utterly terrified, okay? Just to remind you, it wasn't just like the cooks and the cleaners that were stood on the side. It was the trained army, okay? So it was a load of soldiers, okay? Including their king, who in previous chapters we learn about Saul, that he himself was a good head above any other man. So King Saul was not... A small guy, okay? But all of them were just cowering in fear. So Goliath went, went off back. And at this point, the Philistine army probably are playing like cards and just having a few drinks. Because they, they are not bothered in the slightest. Because as far as they're concerned, no one can beat Goliath. So they're not going to have to do anything. The next day comes out, does the same again. Send me your best soldier and we'll fight and I'll crush him. And again, the Israelites look terrified. That happened for 40 days in a row, okay? Some modern scholars and theologians have said that perhaps Goliath wasn't as scary and big as the Bible makes him out. Now, I find it hard to believe because it says for 40 days he came out and taunted an army of trained soldiers and for 40 days they all just cowered in fear. There's no mistaking that Goliath was a scary looking soldier and he was a warrior trained to fight. But then one day it's finally your time, Josh. Are you ready? This shepherd boy, okay, this young son, some of his older brothers were part of the cowering Israelite army. He's been sent by his dad to bring some bread and supplies to his brothers and to get a little report and report back to his dad about how it's all going. He turns up and he looks at the Israelite army who are looking terrified. He asks about what's happening. He says, what's going on here? And they go, oh, he's really massive, and oh, I'm really scared. And David is confused by this situation. And he says to Saul, let nobody lose heart. I'll go and fight him. Now, it doesn't go into many details there, but I would imagine at this point, there was probably a lot of laughter. There was probably a lot of taunting and sneering. It does say that actually one of David's brothers taunts him and says, what are you doing here? What are you even talking about? Why, why are you here? And Saul says a similar thing. He says, you can't go and fight him. You're just a mere shepherd boy. At which point, I nearly said Josh. That's you and a different biblical character. But in a similar story though, right? Because Joshua and Caleb, that's where Caleb came into it. 
Also, after a lot of wandering for about 40 years this time, they saw giants in the land, and everybody else was scared of the giants, but Joshua and Caleb believed what God had told them. Anyway, I digress to the side. Back to the story. David says to Saul, no, 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 you're, you're thinking I'm way less than I am. Don't you remember? I'm a shepherd. So every now and again, a bear comes along. A, a bear, just let that sink in, by the way. A, a bear and a lion. He's like, bears and lions come and try and attack my sheep all the time. I just take them out. I just, I mean, it basically describes David wrestling with bears and lions. And he's like, if they get a little bit lippy and a little bit mouthy, I just grab them by the head and then I just, poof, I take them down. And I've protected my sheep. So David definitely wasn't this puny little weakling that sometimes we have him pictured as. He wasn't a trained soldier and as as from a human perspective, he definitely wasn't a match on the battlefield to Goliath, the Goliath that was stood in front of him. But he also wasn't as weak and unskilled as some may think. So he tells Saul this, and, and then Saul says, oh, okay, well, don't, try my armor on. So he puts the armor on him. Do you want to wander around like you're walking in armor that's too big? Probably a little bit like you did at Christmas in that giant inflatable suit. That's actually perfect. At which point he throws the armor down, throw it down says, I can't fight in this. I can barely even walk in this. He says, no, it's fine. I'll just go with what I've got. And so, wait a second. Because also, when we hear catapult or slingshot, we think like a kid's toy catapult. You know, like one of those little wireframe things with a little elastic band that a child might make. That's what, pit, that's what a lot of the time, and in, even in the storybooks for kids, that's what is often... But it says that David got a slingshot. And back then, during warfare, there would have been archers. There would have been what are called slingers. Okay, slingers. And they were basically kind of like artillery. Okay, and it's it, it said that one of these slingers can hit a target with a stone from 100 to 200 yards. And the, the speed of the stone would have been similar to the, a bullet coming out of a 45 caliber handgun. So, David knows how to use this, and the, the smooth stones that often we think may be pedals that he would have picked up from the river would have been similar to this. So, he says he picked up five smooth stones. Oh, I have actually got smooth stones. I wonder if I've got five smooth stones. There you go, challenging. Oh, there's a slightly smaller one. How many have you got? Okay, let's go for this one. It's not as smooth. So five smooth stones. Five smooth stones he picks up and he knows what to do with these smooth stones. Now there's also, I tell you what, you can get lost in a rabbit hole on the internet when you Google the story of David and Goliath. Especially if you ask, why did he pick up five stones? Oh my goodness, there are some wacky theories out there. I mean, I'm talking completely off the planet theories of why he picked up smooth stones. I mean, there's people that say that Goliath had like four brothers and he thought he was going to have to fight the four brothers as well. There's people that say each stone represents a little bit of like God's character and grace and mercy and forgiveness. I think that probably the reason he picked up five stones is because you wouldn't run into a fight. Like if you had a gun, for example, you wouldn't go into battle with one bullet for your gun, would you? Because you might, you might miss. So I think probably the best theory is that he, he thought, well, I might not hit with the first stone, so I probably should have some backup stones. So I mean, I don't know that. It doesn't say, but that's probably the most logical explanation. So he picks up these stones. He's got a sling. He goes out into battle. And obviously at this point, you're just like, <laughs> look at this guy. <laughs> Why are you coming at me with sticks and stones? Sticks and stones. Uh, he basically abuses David for a while, and David replies and says, well, you come at me with these swords and the spears and the javelin, but you have defied the living God, the creator of the universe. That's who I'm attacking you with. And then it describes an amazing thing. It says that as Goliath approaches, David runs towards the battle line. He doesn't just kind of cower at the back. He charges towards Goliath. He takes one of his stones. Don't actually do this, please. And he, he slings it at Goliath. Hits him in the head. Goliath is dead. 
and the rest of the stuff uh, happens. And we won't go into too much detail there because there's children. Goliath, gone. The great champion, the Israelites, victorious. The Philistines, losers. Sorry, guys. Bunch of losers over here. Look, they are playing the part excellently. Well done, guys. <laughs> Only for this moment. Afterwards, you can have a coffee and cake. We'll all be friends. It's fine. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You may, you may have a seat. So I take this back. Uh, just pop the rocks down there. Good, good, good. Okay. So, as always, I've spent entirely too much time telling that story and haven't got much time left. But there's only a few things I want to say. And as I said, when you look into a story like David and Goliath, there's so many avenues you can go down and there's so many different theories of this and this and this and this. And so I just was praying this week and I was like, God, what, what do you want me to bring out of this story to encourage your people? And so I've got three F's. I don't normally do this, by the way. I, I'm not really particularly bothered about whether the letters match, but I, it just kind of fit. And so the three F's are this. Faith, well the first one, sorry, focus, faith, and flaws. Okay, I'm going to speak very briefly about these things, okay? The first one is focus. In the story, we read that everybody else is focused on Goliath. The Philistine army are chilling out, having a barbecue, playing cards, having some drinks, because they're focused on Goliath and his strength and his size. The Israelite army are focused on Goliath and his strength and his size and his ability. Everybody is focused on the giant, Goliath, except for David. David's focus is sharp, his arrow sharp, and his focus is on God. His focus is on who God is and what he has called David to do. David is well aware of who God is. This is, the, this is the God of heaven and earth. The one who created everything. Why are we cowering in fear? We're on his side. So he's focused. That's what David is focused on. So that's the first encouragement this morning is to focus on God. Focus on who God is and who he has made you to be, and what he is calling you to do. The second F is faith. David was focused on God. He knew the stories of God. He knew what God had done in the past. And so when he comes up to this battle line, and he's surrounded by hundreds of cowering, terrified soldiers, David is full of faith, because he knows who God is. He's always been focused on who God is. He knows that God has called him. And so he's full of faith when he runs onto that battlefield. Goliath has no idea. My friend told me this last night. He said, I preached on this recently and I used the phrase, Goliath brought a knife to a gunfight. Goliath had no idea that he basically was the underdog in this story. Everybody else believed he was the champion and he was going to win. But he was completely ill-equipped to fight one of God's chosen soldiers. David was full of focus on God and full of faith in God. And the third F is flawed. And this is the most important one, I think, to be honest. We can talk about being full of focus and full of faith, but this, this F is the one that often trips us up and stops us being all that we are called to be in God. And that is flawed. Because David was flawed. We will hear in later stories how flawed David was. David had weaknesses. You have weaknesses. You are flawed. I'm flawed. I have weaknesses. I've been here for 18 months now. You know that I have some flaws and weaknesses. We all are flawed. But too often... We end up like the Israelite army and we hide behind or our flaws actually become Goliaths in themselves and our flaws stop us doing things. And we, we, we think, oh, I can't, I can't do that. And we listen to the Goliaths. You're not good enough. You've never been good at anything. Why would God love you? Why would God use you? You'll just look stupid if you try that and you'll fall flat on your face. Who's going to listen to you? That is a ridiculous idea. Don't share that with anyone. But that person is way better than you. 
You're not as good as them. You can't do what they can do. And we end up just playing these thoughts in our head. And our flaws become giants in our lives and stop us doing what God has called us to do. You will never be perfect this side of heaven. You will always have flaws. Yes, you can learn to iron out some flaws and you can learn to turn some weaknesses into strengths, but there will always be flaws. And so we must remember to be focused on who God has called us to be and have faith in God and everything that he has called us to be. And acknowledge our flaws, but actually as David did with Goliath, not be afraid not live in fear, but to run head on into everything God has called us to do. So quickly, to conclude, to finish, what has God called you to do? Well, on a kind of general scale for all of us, at at the end uh, of uh, his life, his last thing he says to his disciples, before he goes back to heaven, he says, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. So all of us are called to do that. We're called to live out our faith, focus on Jesus, have faith in Jesus, and help other people to discover Jesus and live for Jesus as well. That's what we're all called to do. Well, how do you do that? Well, a little bit earlier in Matthew, uh, Jesus says, he's been challenged about what the greatest commandment is, and he says, love God and love people. That's the best way to make disciples and draw people to Jesus is to love them and care for them at the same time loving God. And the next bit is where it gets a bit more specific because you might ask, well, how do I do that, Pete? How do I love God and, and love people? Well, it's quite simple, really. And the answer is, what do you love to do? What are your passions? What are your strengths? What, what really gets you ticking? What do you, what do you love? Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's science. Maybe it's maths. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's sport. Maybe it's making coffee. Maybe it's cleaning. Maybe you really love cleaning. Maybe it's uh, working at a hospital as a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist or a porter even. What do you love to do? Take that thing and whilst you're doing it, love God and love the people around you. It's as simple as that. Oh, I thought it was Caleb, it's not, it's Evie. Hey Evie. That's it. Love God and love people by doing what you love to do. Maybe you've not discovered it yet. Maybe you're a little bit younger. Maybe you're a child, you're figuring stuff out. Caleb at the moment is just, just learning about everything. He sits there with a toy now and he doesn't always push it around. He just like moves it and like checks out the wheels and check. yesterday he got well stressed by a Ferrari at his grandparents house because the wheels steered and he'd never seen that before utterly freaked out we had to take the toy away in the end it was becoming too much for him hey buddy I know I was talking about you hey that's all we've got to do love God love people by doing what you love to do because here's the big thing God made you so generally the things you love to do and the things you are God at, good at is what God put in you. So, focus on God, have faith in God, acknowledge that you are flawed, but don't let them hold you back from what God has called you to do. To make disciples by loving God, worshipping him, praising him, reading his word, reading the Bible with other people as well, and then loving people around you in whatever setting you find yourself in. Love God, love people, because he loves you, and he created you to do these things. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you uh, for this story of David and Goliath, and I thank you uh, how encouraging it is to us that actually, like David, we are flawed. We have weaknesses, but like David, we are called to do things for you to bring glory to your name, to draw people to you, to give people hope and joy and peace by meeting you, the one who can give them ultimate peace and joy and hope and love. I pray for all of us here, would we figure out what it is that we love to do and would we do it for you as best as we can? Not focusing on someone else and thinking, oh, that person could just do it better. I'm not as good as them. No, no, no. 
believing that each of us are created by you to do great things for you, God. Amen.